if you have a Bible, I'd love you to turn to the second to the last book of the Bible, and it's called Jude. It's also like the, the one of the shorter ones, okay? So it's the book of Jude. Everybody say, hey, Jude. Not that. It's actually Jude, the brother of James, one of the apostles, the very first apostle that was martyred. And um, he wrote a, a letter to the church, and it's called Jude. And in this letter is one of the very few times that the phrase, pray in the Spirit, is used. And he uses it in this context. In Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 1, I'm not reading right now, I'm just paraphrasing. Verse 1, he, he, he addresses the church, and he calls them the saints in God who are kept by God. And then he goes in and describes these kind of um, hypocrites that have come into the church, and they're peppering the church with false teaching, with false doctrines, with rumors about Jesus already coming back, Gnosticism, and all kinds of rumors and, and, and fake living. They were using the grace of Jesus. Come on, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. And then you get your sin-free card and you start using it as a license to sin all you want. That's called a, 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 um, abusing the grace of God. And the Bible says there in Jude chapter one, it's only one chapter in Jude, that people are abusing the grace of God. And the church is getting very discouraged because there's attacks coming against the church. There's knowledge coming against the church. There's hypocrites coming against the church. There's false teachings coming against the church. There's terrible division. And he says these people, these men, they're, they're divisive because they, they don't have the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says. They live by mere human instincts. There's a big difference in living by your gut and living by the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, these are humans who just live and run organizations and try to dominate the church by their gut. And they do not have the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, but you, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. It's a shame. Many of us live our entire lives governed by natural human instincts, and we have the Holy Spirit, but we don't know how to live by the Spirit. We only know how to live by our gut, and we don't do that very well at times. But he says, these the people are an enemy of the church because they come and they turn a spiritual organization into a man-made organization that just operates by instincts, void of the Spirit. And Jude says this, but you, beloved, that's people loved by God, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Tonight I'm preaching a message called Praying in the Spirit. Come on, write that down. Praying in the Spirit, and let's pray. Father, tonight, teach us how to pray in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, buckle your bump, bump your neighbor and say, that was a fast prayer. <laughs> well, I don't know what you grew up watching on TV, but I grew up watching a few different shows that would pepper on, you know, on and, you know, here and there. And there was one that was routine. And, um, and there was a big difference between every other show and this show because there was a deaf bodybuilder by the name of Lou Ferrigno, who um, was known as like, he was like Mr. Olympia. He was like one of the biggest bodybuilders in the world. And so as a kid, I, I kind of wanted to have big old muscles like him and Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these different bodybuilders. And so when I'd see him on a show, I didn't know the difference between Lou Ferrigno and the green guy, Hulk. So I'd watch this show and I'd see, I know it's a blurry picture, just deal with it. All right, so I'd, I'd, I'd watch the show and I'd see Bruce Banner, but if he stayed Bruce the entire television show, I didn't want to watch it the next week. And luckily there was never a week where Bruce Banner stayed Bruce Banner. Eventually somebody made him mad. <laughs> And eventually when he got mad, he started busting out of his shirts and busting out of his clothes and his shorts start busting, his toes grow, his whole body grows and he starts Hulk smashing everything in sight. And I'm like, there's a difference between Bruce Banner and the Hulk. Many of you um, are, grew up with, with some of the, the other superheroes and another one that comes to mind is uh, Peter Parker. 
Peter Parker um, is just a kid. He's a, a school kid that has you know, like a backpack and he's walking the halls of school and everybody you know, kind of thinks he's a normal little nerd guy, except whenever something is in need and then all of a sudden this little backpack of clothes or whatever it is that he hides from his mom and hides from everybody else is hiding in his closet. And when he busts that out and puts it on his body, the dude can climb buildings with his fingertips. I'm talking about superpowers. I know you don't believe they're real, but they're real. Like Spider-Man's not real. Okay, so then there's one more. I want to show you one more, just one more. And this one's fascinating. This one actually fits the whole point of the message tonight better than every other superhero because this is one that actually would go into a booth and literally change his clothes and that would change his powers and there were certain things that would drain his power. And so if you put kryptonite beside him, it would drain his power. And many other superheroes had drains. And based on how they handled what drained their power determined their influence over their targeted enemy. Well, I did a little bit more research and I wanted to find out the ranking. Come on, how many of y'all are interested in the top 20 rankings of the powers of the superheroes? I know you're not, but I'm gonna show them to you anyway, all right? There they are. Number two is Superman. Number three, y'all ain't even heard of no Franklin Richard. Am I even saying that right? Guko, come on, how many of y'all... I was just testing, y'all. <laughs> Dr. Manhattan. Jean Grey, or is it Jean Grey? How do y'all say that? I don't even know. Jean Grey, Martian Manhunter, Silver Surfer. I don't know about that dude. Thor, I know he got a big old hammer. Flash, come on, Flash Gordon. Shazam, Hulk, made number 12. Wonder Woman, she, uh, Wonder Woman, man, she bad. How many of y'all watch Wonder Woman? <laughs> she, all the women say, hi. Captain Marvel, Doctor Strange, Hercules, 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 Supergirl, Scarlet Witch, Deadpool, Aquaman. What would you rank as number one and why? When I read the description, I don't even know how to say it. Is it the Spectre or the Spectra? Have you even heard of this guy? Listen to this and tell me how much this sounds like God. Watch this, watch. Not your average superhero. The spectre is a cosmic entity and the physical embodiment of God's vengeance on earth. Watch this. You're about to see in what's ranked, and go ahead and Google it, in the top superhero, highest power level ever created by a human brain in today's world, they can't get better than God. That's exactly what they're describing as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Watch this. God's vengeance on the earth. A divine empowerment. He possesses unlimited strength, that's omnipotent, and he can control reality along with time. What is that? Omnipresent and space and has access to knowledge, the knowledge of the universe. Omniscience, all knowledge. They describe the most powerful superhero that Hollywood, Marvel, anyone can come up with and they basically write out the Messiah, God in flesh. But what truly sets him apart from every other super being is his raw physical strength. His power is so great, he needs a human form to be able to control it. He is invulnerable to all physical attacks unless he allows it. Oh, I read that and I thought, man. Jesus Christ died on a cross, ridding his physical body of all power to save you. Didn't live a life of vengeance to punish everything and destroy everything, yet he knew all things. Omn gave up omnipresence, gave up all that to become a man, human form. When I hear the phrase, by the Spirit, in Scripture, I want you to understand, that is not a phrase to describe Jesus. Praying in the Spirit, praying by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, worshiping in Spirit, worshiping by the Spirit, all of these are phrases to describe God's number one choice of superheroes on this planet today, and it's you. 
just like Clark Kent is able to transform from the flesh to Superman, God wants to equip you to understand the difference from when you are in the flesh and when you are in the spirit. And to realize that all power authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ and he can do immeasurably more than you can ask, think, or imagine according to his power that is at work within you and within me. And with all that power, why in the world would he equip people to pray in the spirit? Here's what I want to share with you tonight, and I'm going to unpack it, okay? When you see the phrase in the spirit or by the spirit, here's what that means. Okay, go ahead and get him off of there, right? It's this. Come on, read it out loud. It's not from the Bible. It's my definition, okay? It's, it's accurate. You're welcome to challenge it. We can challenge that <laughs> over some Cajun food sometime, all right? So doing things in a way that God himself is the one doing it in you and through you with his power and character. It's possible to operate in the power of God without the character of God. And it's possible to have the character of God and never allow the power of God to work through you. But tonight, what if you pursued the character of God with all your heart and you received the power of God with all of your faith and allowed God to change your world? So three questions I'm going to unpack tonight. Three questions about praying in the Spirit. So you want to write them down, you can write them down. I'm going to walk through these three things. And the first one is, what is praying in the Spirit? And I think this is going to be a very helpful message for everybody who's heard this phrase and everybody who hasn't heard this phrase. Number two, why do I or should I pray in the Spirit? So I'm going to address the answer to why prayer in the Spirit is essential for believers in Christ. And number three, I'm going to answer how do I pray in the Spirit? I'd love for you to take notes. All of our messages are posted online on our podcast. It's available on iTunes and also on um, our webpage at myanchorchurch.com. And um, also they're posted, the video is posted on YouTube. And so you can go back and watch this later as well. And you're going to want to. There's going to be a lot of meat in here that I know you're going to want to recap, okay? So here's the first question. What is praying in the Spirit? What is praying in the Spirit? And praying in the Spirit is praying so that the Holy Spirit is the moving and the guiding power in the prayer with understanding or in tongues. I want you to write that phrase down, and I'm going to unpack tonight what praying in tongues is, what the gift of tongues is. I decided to kick off the next four weeks. We're talking about what spiritual gifts are and what it means, what what the Holy Spirit's gifts are. What are his powers? What are his superpowers that he wants to activate in your life and in the church. And I went ahead and picked the most controversial one up front because it's the one that's for you. The rest of them are for the body, but this one is specifically for you. And so I'm gonna share with you what that is. Ephesians chapter six and verse 18 gives us one of the first mentions of praying in the spirit. And I want you to note a couple of different phrases here, okay? He says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Well, that phrase, on all occasion, occasions, is what makes mo- a lot of people believe that praying in the Spirit can't be praying in tongues or include tongues because God doesn't want you walking around always praying in tongues. And they're like, that's not what it means. Look at the next phrase, with all kinds of prayers, <laughs> which means praying in the Spirit includes all kinds of prayers all kinds of requests, all kinds of petitions, all kinds of of talking to God and praising God and from your mouth, changing reality from your heart by declaring truth to God. It's a power. God, I, I want you to understand that as Clark Kent changes his clothes and goes into a phone booth, you are designed to experience the same transformation when you pray in the Spirit. When you enter into the presence of God by his spirit, and you can do it in your car, you can do it running, you can do it working out, you can do it in a ball game, you can do it whenever. The Holy Spirit is alive and active and ready to work through you no matter where you are. He is not governed or limited to some building. He's fully active wherever you are, and he desires to fully activate heaven in your life to change your world. Ephesians, Paul says this, that with with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. 
Well, many of you are familiar with the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians chapter 6 especially is the book from verse 10 all the way down to verse 20 is the, the longest little description for what's called spiritual warfare. And what he says in this description of spiritual warfare is that there's a helmet of salvation. There's a breastplate of righteousness to protect your character. There's a belt of truth that's girding up your loins. There's a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There's feet fitted with readiness. And what ties all of these into spiritual weapons is praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit is not just something that you need to understand. It is the key. And you're going to see tonight, I'm going to unpack it. It is a key, not to saving you, but a key to God keeping you in His love. Many of us, when we pray, do not, haven't understood the difference. I understood the difference pretty strongly today. Um, last night, I was uh, at someone's house watching my favorite football team die an embarrassing death on national TV. And I prayed in the spirit, man, it didn't work at all. I was like, God, don't care about them. I, don't, I, was, I, was, I, did, I did not pray because God could care less about college football. <laughs> Maybe he can, does, but I, I don't pray for the Tigers to win because, you know, all, I've, I've seen Bruce Almighty. I've seen the movie, you know. Y'all aren't laughing, but that means somebody else. Anyway, so I, I, I come home, and when, when LSU is bad, like not even a good team, and I don't expect them to win, I check out at halftime. I'm like, it's, it's no big deal, you know. They play like they did when I was there. Like, we weren't any good. They got good right after I left. But when you expect them to win, and you expect the big old fat, arrogant SEC to come to Los Angeles and show that pack group of people, pack, what are you, pack 10, pack 12, who's boss? And then you leave like beat 38, 27. You're kind of like, man, LS who? <laughs> and I woke up this morning, and I read some news, and I'm, it, it, I'm a human being. And when I watch a whole game, and I spend an hour reading comments, at night before I go to bed, and I wake up in the morning and I hit videos and I got texts from people and all that, I have to intentionally shift gears or I'll be preparing for a message in the flesh. Completely. And then all it takes is something to go wrong here and something to go wrong here. Then my prayers, I go to pray, and my prayers become things that I want, when I want it, how I want it, why I want it. And sometimes it becomes just arguing with God or complaining to God, or I don't even pray. James chapter four tells us this, that when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. How many of you would love to experience the power of not praying and no longer praying, never praying again for your own will and with your own motives so you can have what you want, do what you want, live like you want and be dominant on this earth? And what if the Holy Spirit could come and motivate and move you and guide you in prayer that's in alignment with the will of God, alignment with the heart and the character of Jesus Christ? I love this, this phrase from one of my favorite, like, kind of theologians, if you will, a guy named Thomas Merton. He says it this way, prayer is a work too hard for us. Now, I don't know what your prayer life is about like, but I did some research this week and I realized that only 30% of Christians or religious people in the whole United States of America, all denominations, only 30% of people say that they pray more than five times a year. And if only 30%, I wonder what the stats are for us. I wonder who prays even in the flesh. Who even brings a selfish prayer to God? Who brings a more than a three-minute conversation? And I want to submit to you something that I know the difference in now, but I didn't know the difference early in my Christianity. I didn't know the difference in thinking about God and praying. Praying is actually when the words come off your lips from your heart to Him. And Thomas Merton says, prayer is a work too hard for us. Meaning that if you, husbands, there's a, perf, there's a powerful verse in scripture that says, listen, love your wife and treat her with respect so that nothing hinders your prayer. I'm like, oh man, that no reason. 
No wonder lots of my prayers are coming unanswered if I have a broken relationship that matters to God. So praying in the Spirit is not just some utterance from your mouth. It is praying with, by, and the motives of the Holy Spirit. And it is impossible to pray on our own. Who wants to pray unheard, unanswered? Not me. Lord, help us. Merton goes on to say, we can put words into prayer, but it is the Spirit that puts in the affections without which it is cold babbling and prayer without heart. It is a work expressed as striving. Here's a verse from Romans 15, 30. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. It is a striving with God himself and there is no possibility of wrestling with God, <laughs> but by God's own strength. Let me show you um, a breakdown of this verse. And um, the second question is this. One number one is what, what is praying in the Holy Spirit? And it's praying, being guided and moved by the Spirit with knowledge and in tongues. And I'll explain, explain tongues in, in the third point. Why do I pray in the Spirit? Jude chapter one, verse 20 says this. But you, beloved, now, I am breaking this down. I want you to get this tonight. This is a very important teaching, okay? But you, beloved, okay, building yourselves up, okay, on your most holy faith means there is a need to build yourself up in and on your faith. And the way he says to build yourself up is not go and listen to a podcast. Don't go read a book. Build yourself up by switching clothes from the flesh to the spirit and surrender your will and your mouth to God in the presence of God and allow your whole being to begin coming into alignment with who you really are. And that is a spiritual being who has a soul and lives in a body. Bring that part of you into alignment. That's why church is so refreshing. It's not just coming together to hear a talk on a Sunday night or just coming together to gather around friends. No, it's where people literally shift clothes for a period of time. You think like you don't think out there. It's not even like listening to a podcast. You're in the atmosphere of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is present in you and you and you and you and we come together, God moves inside of us and it sort of like brings us all back to north. It brings that whole antenna back. And he's like, build yourselves up when you're alone in your most holy faith. How? By coming into alignment with praying in the Spirit. Now, here's something else I want to show you that's pretty powerful is that next phrase. It says, keep yourselves in the love of God. I started to think about what drains Superman and if you watch Superman, he puts some green kryptonite beside him, you know, and he touches the kryptonite. I mean, he loses all his power. How many of y'all have ever heard the story of Samson? Samson is like a judge in the book of Judges. And he's known as the most powerful. He's like Hercules and Incredible Hulk and all of them together. I mean, he's like the strongest man in the whole nation of Israel. And this woman named Delilah was trying to figure out how to take him out. And she's like, how can I like get his strength? Because he like kills all of our enemies and I got to figure out how to get his strength taken from him. And so she persuades him with sexuality to tell her. And he said, uh, if you cut my hair, I'll become as strong as a natural man. And basically what he described to her was how to tear him down from spirit to flesh. We don't have to describe to the enemy today how to tear down the church from spirit to flesh. There are several things that are mentioned in the book of Jude that tear you down from spirit to flesh. One of those things is waiting. Waiting on the Lord to come and hearing Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, and waking up one more morning and going to bed one more night and he hadn't come yet. Hearing that he heals all your diseases and, and praying and praying and praying and not seeing a disease healed. But when you have people who start to pepper, uh, pepper and, and pick apart the gospel and live as hypocrites and make fun of your faith, make fun of your efforts, make fun of your spirituality, 
and bring natural human instincts to your life and saying, duh, why are you praying? Why don't you just go to the hospital? Why are you praying? Why don't you just take this? Why are you actually fasting? That's dumb. Why don't you just do this? That's exactly what was happening there. And Jude tells us, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy, most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. What this means is there's a need for you to keep yourself in the love of God. You're like, Jeff, that's sacrilegious. It's not sacrilegious. I understand there's a whole doctrine. It's called, have you ever heard of Calvinism? You ever heard of Calvinism? No, Calvinism. Maybe you've heard of that. And what, what, here's what Calvinism says. If God is so sovereign, God's sovereign, he's the one who keeps us. All right, look at my hand. Watch this. Watch my hand. If God's the one who keeps us, then why do we need to do anything to keep ourselves in the love of God if he's the one who sovereignly keeps us? If God already knows what we're going to pray for, why do we have to pray it? If God already knows who's going to be this and this, and he's sovereign, knows all things, then why do we have to pray? Jude chapter 1 verse 1 says, you who are kept. Everybody say the word kept. Come on, say it out loud. Kept. You're kept by God. The very last verse of the book of Jude says to all of you who are being kept by God. If we're kept by God, then why does God let us participate in the keeping? Why? I don't know why, but I'm glad he does. I'm glad that somehow God tells me, Jeff, there's something in following Jesus called the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints is not working for your salvation. It's living in a way that proves to God you know who you are and you know you're saved. And one of the things God empowers you to do is pray in the Holy Spirit, getting your will into alignment with Jesus Christ. And I'll just submit to you, this is not a bashing of anybody because I'm just as guilty as anybody else, but I will submit to you that if you don't pray and if you're not a praying person and you never pray and you never worship, you just watch and listen and do American Christian things. You really need to test your salvation. You may, not, you may not be a follower of Jesus. It is impossible to be a follower of Jesus and not have a relationship with him. And the number one way to have a relationship with Jesus is through the avenue of prayer. And the number one way to pray is in the spirit. Now, the Bible tells us that when we pray in the spirit, I wanna show you what this is. And this is, this is not just praying in tongues. This is praying in a way, I actually encourage people to actually develop what's called prayer tracks. A track is something that, that you, you do that helps you stay focused. And so I'm gonna give you like just a couple of, they're not gonna be on the screen, but I'm gonna give you just a couple of like little five minute tracks that have worked for me, they work for me now. There, there's one of them I'm actually doing now on a regular basis. I learned this from Pastor Larry Stockstill down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And um, Pastor Larry I mean, we were down there, Marcus Stern, Pastor Marcus, Pastor Justin and I were down there um, a couple of weeks ago. And Larry is 68 years old. He's been in full-time ministry for 52 years. He has planted over 50,000 churches around the world. 11 of the largest churches in the United States of America come from pastors that came from his church. And he's one of my personal mentors and heroes in the faith. And he's very, he's very encouraging to me personally. I have a personal relationship with him. We're very, we're very good friends, friends with his family. And the most inspiring thing about him is he would, let me back up a second. When I was in college, I used to drive over from LSU all the way to a city called Baker, Louisiana. And Baker is a city that's kind of in the Northeast of Baton Rouge. And I would go there to the Bethany World Prayer Center on Saturday nights, to Saturday Night Live and I'd listen to him preach. I'd go back there on Wednesday nights and I'd listen to him preach. Services would go a couple of hours. Worship would go a whole hour. And I would take notes and I'd, I'd just... And then I started to realize that he's not just a pastor. He is the spiritual advisor to the governor of the state of Louisiana. You ought to hear that story sometime. A very influential man. And out of all those things, let me tell you the most impressive thing about Pastor Larry Stockstill. Every morning... He gets up with his wife and they pray in their own chairs for one hour today. 
And then they go on a one and a half mile walk together. And then he eats his breakfast and she eats her oatmeal every single day. And when he tells me that, Pastor Jeff, the most powerful thing you can do in your preaching is not just the preparation, but you bust out about an hour and a half of praying in the spirit before you ever give up there and you get up there and you're going to see things change in your church. That may be true for me, but what about you? What would happen if your prayer life went from throwing up one before breakfast or throwing up one whenever you need a breakthrough in the finances or throwing up one when somebody says, pray for a friend here to an ongoing habitual track oriented relationship with God? It's why we do the 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's why we gave you the prayer journals. It's why we do these things. It's to to help you out. You can actually start off with just Psalm 23. And literally read it out loud. Or you can take the Lord's Prayer, our Father. You can just say the our our Father and break it down. And like literally stop at each phrase and just describe to the Lord who he is when you say Father. And listen, the very first time you do it, you may only pray for two minutes. You may only pray for 30 seconds, but it's more than zero. And what happens is when you bump from zero to 0.1, that's massive improvement. As a matter of fact, in my world, come on, when you bump from a negative 10 to a negative 9.75, that's improvement. And so what if, what, what if you take a step today to say, listen, I'm going to start tonight by the power of the Spirit to move in praying in the Spirit. I like this last part. Now to him who is able to keep you, He's the one who's able to keep you from stumbling. And the way he does it is starting the conversation of prayer with you. Because when you're praying in the spirit, it's hard to stumble when you're on your knees, right? You've heard that phrase before. And so the the whole point of him stirring up the spirit in you is to get you out of the flesh and into the spirit. And when you're in the spirit, the gifts manifest. The glory of God is revealed in your life. The character of God is revealed in your life. And man, how many of y'all know it is so easy because I've done this. I've gone from praying for an hour and a half to mad as a hornet 20 minutes later. How many of y'all have ever done that? How much more do we need to pray in the spirit? Husbands, if your wife is doing all the praying, it's time for you to take up the mantle. Wives, if your husband's the one doing all the praying, it's time for you to take up the mantle. And what if 30 seconds of that three minute prayer that you bring up to the Lord in the spirit is for your spouse out loud from your heart. And you ask him, show me what to do today. Lead me. That's praying in the spirit. Now let's go into the modes, the modes. How do I pray in the spirit? This is where most people kind of dig their heels in and like, oh, is he fixing to get weird? Yeah, I'm about to get weird. Two modes of praying in the Holy Spirit. The first one is with known language. The second way is with the gift of tongues. Known language, gift of tongues. I put the two brains up here because most people think that that's the analytical part of you and the sensational part of you. And I'm just going to tell you, neither of those things are true. Praying in the spirit is not praying with your intuition or your gut. Your intuition, your gut, your soul, your emotions, all of that, listen to me, all of that, is a part of who you are. That's your soul. I'm talking about your spirit. Your spirit is that part of you that God created in his image to live forever. Is this too deep? Are y'all with me? You're tracking with me? I hope it's not too deep because this is like the foundation of everything you believe. You are spirit. You're going to die. Your spirit's going to heaven. God is spirit. He's spirit. Why are people so afraid to talk about and study spirit? I don't know, but we are. The gift of tongues is praying and singing with your spirit. Praying in the spirit also includes praying in a known language. Like, Pastor Jeff, that's a little confusing. All right, so look at this verse with me, and I'll break it down a little bit. The Bible says in Ephesians 6.18, pray in the spirit and on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for the Lord's people. Romans 8, 26 says this, likewise, I don't know if you've read this before, the way way it's written, actually. Likewise, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. That's our flesh. For we don't know what to pray. And I would would emphasize that when he says, 
for as we ought, meaning we don't know what to pray or how to pray. (laughs) And when you don't know how to pray or what to pray and you just start talking, it's best to not start talking and go ahead and let the Holy Spirit pray. It's best to let the Holy Spirit have his way when you're in the flesh. Let him do the praying. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us or in us or with us with groanings too deep for words. So let me show you what the gift of tongues is because this is something that may be confusing. You may have never heard anyone teach this. And I'll tell you, I've been doing ministry for 30 years, full time, okay? I've been preaching a long time. This is the very first time in 30 years that I have ever spoken from the platform teaching what the gift of tongues is from the platform. That's how much people want to skip over this gift, (laughs) Because it's the thing that makes you feel the weirdest is when something's coming out of your mouth that you don't understand. And so I want to show you what it is. Don't think we're getting weird here. It's the Bible. I'm going to show you just as clear as I can. Okay, number one, it is a known, it's known to as speaking in tongues. And so people ask all the time, does, does your church speak in tongues? Well, I don't know who does and who doesn't. What they're asking literally is do people pray in the spirit in an unknown language? That's what they're asking. Number two, It's an utterance of syllables or sounds from the mouth in prayer to God. Number three, I'm going to show you all the scripture for this in a second. It is understood only by God. Number four, it can be prayer, a praise or prayer or singing. Number five, it is not a human language that one might encounter in some foreign country but it is a spirit-empowered capacity to speak in a heavenly language that is from the Spirit and only understood by God. Pastor Jeff, back all that up with Scripture. All right, you got it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 2. Come on, put your study hat on. I'm going to knuckle bump you and you go get dinner. All right, here we go. Verse 2, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says this, for anyone, raise your hand if you're anyone. Is that you? Anybody else say anyone? That's everybody, all right? Anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. This is the Apostle Paul saying that the gift of tongues is not to speak to people. It's to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. That's why Jude says, build yourselves up in in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You're like, well, praying in the Spirit, I thought you said it's praying moved by God. This is, that's exactly what John Piper teaches and exactly what many other pastors teach is that it's praying moved by the Spirit and guided by the Holy Spirit in the ways of the Spirit and not in the flesh. And I'll tell you straight up, the Apostle Paul says it also includes praying in tongues. Here's what he says. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Or I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. Paul, the Apostle Paul, didn't say that praying in the Spirit in a heavenly language is just for people in the first century. He wants every single one of us to experience praying in the Spirit in tongues. And then he says this, I'd like for every one of you to speak in tongues, but I'd rather have you prophesy. And he's talking about in the church, because if you take off doing something like that in public, people are going to think you're weird. He actually says that. And he says this in verse 15, so what shall I do? Now watch this. This is where the language gets really clear. Stay with me. This is really important, okay? I will pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my understanding. Then in verse 16, otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, that's in a, a, a language, a tongue that you don't understand. It's an utterance from your mouth. You don't understand. How can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say, amen? (laughs) I mean, seriously, like if Katie Plyler starts taking off speaking in in Spanish, I can't say amen. I can say gloria adios because that's the only like Spanish I know. Or I can say mi espanol y patetico. My Spanish is pathetic. Uh, I can't say amen because I, I can't understand what she's saying. Paul says if anyone takes off praying in their uh, language or praying in tongues or speaking in tongues, nobody understands but God, not even the person speaking. He says, since what you are, since they do not know what you are saying, you are given thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. 
And then he says this, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Why? Because the church, when we come together, is designed to edify, build, and encourage other people. The gift of tongues is not to build anybody up but you. Like, Pastor Jeff, I, I, I ain't ever done that. That's weird. Believe me, I grew up Church of Christ. Like I grew up in a denomination that teaches that the Holy Spirit does nothing outside of the Bible, like doesn't speak, lead, nothing. I grew up thinking like cessationist. I grew up believing completely the Holy Spirit stopped working in the third century when the Bible was complete. I fully understand being freaked out with the Holy Spirit doing weird things in the human body. Are you with me? Come on, can I get a single amen from one person? All right, I thank God I speak in tongues, but in the church, I'd rather speak five words. All right, next part. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So here's the question everybody asks me, and my daughters have asked me this, friends have asked me this, staff members have asked me this, members of Anchor Church have asked me this, hundreds and thousands of people over the last several years have asked me this question, how do I pray in the Spirit? Pray in tongues is one way. Another way you pray in the Spirit is this, with understanding. With understanding. And that is a universal way to pray in the Spirit. And that means being moved by the Spirit. Prompted, fueled, and sustained. Number two, being guided by the Spirit. I'm going to invite the band to come on up to the, the platform now. Being guided with the Spirit, His will, His character, and His motives. And establish prayer paths. Pray in the Word, the Lord's Prayer. Psalm 23, many other prayers in Scripture. Let me tell you my experience with this. And, um, and then we'll move on. In um, high school, I was uh, dating a girl who went to this church that I, my, my dad called them Fruit Loops. <laughs> Fruit Loops, because they like danced and ran around the building and had tambourines and flags and everything. And he said, Jeff, you know, be careful of those Fruit Loops. And he actually was from South Louisiana. And he went to one of those Pentecostal Fruit Loops churches where nobody wears makeup and, you know, and, and nobody, you know, women didn't wear pants and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, you know, stay away from the. So I, I grew up with a predisposition to be judgmental against other people who didn't see and believe the way I believed. I, I, I thought that was weird. You're weird. What you're doing, I don't understand. It's weird. And so I literally like wouldn't even date somebody who came from a quote charismatic church. When I got to college, I had a guy named, I'm gonna tell you an extreme here. It's an extreme. I had a guy that came to me from Nigeria, Bainan City, Nigeria. His name is Femi Adebiye. And I had started a, a ministry with some friends teaching English to Chinese students using the gospel of John. And there I was, a six foot four, 300 pound offensive lineman for LSU with a, a buddy of mine picking up Chinese students from the airport, driving them to their dorms and starting teaching them English using the Gospel of John. And a couple other guys were leading that, but I was a big part of, of that ministry. And I, I, um, I would sneak out to the Bethany World Prayer Center on Wednesday nights and on sa Saturday nights. Well, one Sunday night during our worship experience, a guy named Femi Adebiye came forward to receive Christ. And he was trembling. His face was saturated with tears. And he says, I want to follow the Lord Jesus. So I led him in a prayer right there. Took him to the water that night, baptized him in water that night. The next day he shows up at the office on, on campus, the Christian Student Center, and he says, I talked to my mother and my mother told me that there is more. Now, I'm, sometimes my accents sound Nigerian and sometimes I sound Chinese. So just to for, forgive my bad accents here, right? He goes, I believe there is more. I said, ah, you got it, man. You already got it. He goes, no, 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 no. My, my mother told me to find somewhere where they, you get it all. I was like, you got it all, dude. Like you just got it all right there. Holy Spirit's in you, man. Signed, sealed, delivered. You're going to heaven. What else do you want? He's like, no, 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 no. He goes, I, see us. I said, all right, I'll take you to a church where they believe that there's more. And so I took him to Bethany World Prayer Center that night. The worship lasted an hour. The message lasted an hour. 
And then at the end of the message, I see a room of 6,000 people, hundreds of people going down to the front. And this was a church like 25 years ago where they had modesty cloths. I mean, like if a person's praying and they want to like lay down on the floor and pray, they put like sheets over them, man. I mean, like, come on, they'll be covering up their legs. Don't be laying down with no legs covered, uncovered in the church. But if people, people, when it's altar call, nobody stood there and watched. People were hungry for the Lord. They, they're coming down there. And I looked and, man, Femi ought to be, man, he gone. I was like, oh, no, oh, no. Femi, you already got it all. Femi gone, man. I mean, he, shoom, he's gone to the front and there's no catching him. I get all the way down there because I'm going to make sure nobody does anything weird to him. So Femi's down there at the front, and sure enough, man, this guy starts punching him in the belly. I'm like, that ain't in the Bible. And like telling him, come on, you got to get it. You got to get it. Come on, so pray, praying. He's waiting on him to pray in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues. And Femi's like, oh, oh, oh. his lips quivering. His tears are saturating his face. His shirt is wet. And I'm wanting to beat that dude up. I really was. I was like, dude, like, hey, hey, hey. And then they said, come on to the back. And I'm like, Femi, you all right? He goes, yeah. I said, you want me to go with you? He said, yeah. I said, all right. So I'll go to the back. Listen to me. I'm telling you an extreme perverted version of this. That church doesn't even do this anymore. They call them birthing rooms. (laughs) Hundreds of people were backstage in these rooms called birthing rooms. And there were people walking around with clipboards literally writing down the tally of the number of people who started praying in tongues. You talk about embarrassing. My buddy Femi was embarrassed because a person there was talking to him and saying, come on, you can say a syllable, giving him syllables and trying to teach him each syllable to say. And I was like, this is going too far. And I even said that. So, well, I'm not trying to quench the spirit. I'm trying to protect my friend. And I may have been messing things up. I have no idea. But what I do know is about 60 people that night walked out of that back room feeling defeated because they didn't get the gift. And 54 people walked out of there going crazy like Banshee Indians all over the building. And my friend Femi said, that's not what my mother described. And 30 years later or 25 years later, I can tell you this too. What the Holy Spirit wants to do inside of you is simply be God and love you and empower your whole being to love him with his strength and equip your mouth to come into alignment with his will from your spirit. Tonight, I wanna encourage you as we study the next couple of weeks on what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, I wanna encourage you with this gift of, of tongues, praying in the spirit to understand this, it's not gonna be something you catch. You're not just gonna be all of a sudden like standing in court, take off in tongues in front of the judge. You know what I'm saying? Pastor Brad Cruz was telling me a funny story. He started, the first time he started praying in the spirit, he was so scared to go, he was a law enforcement. He's working for the NCIS in South Florida. And he was so scared to go to this, this meeting afterwards because he was afraid he's gonna just take off praying in the spirit in front, uncontrollable. And I just wanna let you know, it's at your will. You're going to have to open up your mouth and let the Holy Spirit move you in prayer. And do not think you're a second-class citizen or any better than anybody else if you pray in the Spirit in a tongue or if you don't pray in the Spirit. But here's what I want you to do. Don't you dare make fun of somebody else who does. And don't you dare make fun of somebody else who doesn't. And don't you dare let this be a divisive issue between you and any other brother and sister at the foot of Jesus Christ being covered by His blood and saturated by His grace. Do not let this be a dividing thing. This is a gift from God for you. You bow your heads and close your eyes.